is there a context in which they're kind of deciding on rules and boundaries for each other? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What's that, that like? always that happens again at the beginning of our year. Mm -hmm. Those systems are really developed the first three to four weeks of the year. It's mm. supposed to be three. Usually we take about four. And during that time period, they're outlining what those systems will look like. They know, okay, we have to have these five systems of operation within our studios. We need to work through activities together to figure out what those systems are. So that's what they do. They'll go from how do we hold uh, our rules of engagement to like what's a system that's going to keep us on track and motivated to do the next thing mm. and down to um, what their schedule looks like sometimes you know that that's another system created what do what are some guardrails we need to place in order for all of us to live together in this little micro community and that's that's mm. how we approach it you know we we're living together in this community what are our rules that are going to keep everybody kind of held to, I don't want to say decorum. That's not, the, <laughs> that's not necessarily the word, but right, right. that keeps us to what our role is and in function within this little mini community or mini society. Mm. And you have the leaders and then you have those who want to be the leaders and sometimes are louder than the leaders. And then you have, you know, that starts to come into play. And then you see the people who really will step up and take ownership over those systems. Those develop naturally. We don't assign them mm. that role. And then once those have developed, there are times where we fall into chaos. Absolutely, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I know those are the moments I need to send an email home to families <laughs> that say, hey, you may have heard today someone was standing on a half wall or you know you may have heard that this is what's happening and i assure you yes it is uh, yeah. you know and sometimes just validating what the child came home to say and then some guiding conversation parents can have with their children mm. so i try to approach that usually i send that out i approach it from the perspective of i'm a parent you know mm -hmm. this is what's worked for my kids my you know what works for my kids might not work for you, but maybe you can take this idea and develop it further. And so by doing that, now you've got this 360 degree support for that mm -hmm. child as they grow and learn to develop and make their own decisions. Right, right. They stay to they stay true to their systems or they don't. <laughs> right, right. And and whatever the consequence is falls upon their shoulders. So it's their decision whether to rise or to fall during that time as all civilization sometimes does. Are you going to rise or fall based on the systems that you're holding in place? Uh -huh. And, you know, our middle school fell quite a few times this year. Uh -huh. And then how do we rise from those? And so I think that that is what keeps it going mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the fact that they're holding each other you know, accountable to those systems. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr.